Znači, puno se priča o tipovima danas, Facebook ura taj svoj flow, ali da bi će zanimljivo čuti TypeScript stranu i kako se komponirati u neku smislanu celinu. Ok, pa možemo krenuti, evo da Matija, ti si prvi na redu. Sad se mjute. To je to to? Je. Ok. Da, ok. So today I wanted to talk about uh, commutes, uh, what they are, and how to write them using a Facebook tool called uh, Jazz Coaching. Uh, before everything, I'm uh, Matja, uh, my Twitter handle is uh, Silvanon, and I work in this world. Uh, and uh, everybody knows uh, who works in front end that we uh, refactor our code a lot. I, I would uh, say that we we, we refactor it much more often than we do backend code. Uh, because uh, whether we are changing dependencies uh, or if we are improving the code in, in another way. Uh, let's say uh, concerning dependencies. Concerning dependencies, uh, let's say that we're starting a new project and we have installed a bunch of dependencies and uh, after a day, we type in this command. I don't know who of you have typed ever typed this command. This prints out all the dependencies that, uh, that have some updates upcoming. And this is a very masochistic way to de develop because uh, this is, you are actively searching for more work, like you don't have enough of it already. So maybe uh, the next day of your project, the list will be fairly. Uh, Fairly, um, it will be only a handful of updates, but uh, very soon, very soon it will just become unmanageable. So if you have some kind of, um, if you have some kind of a need to always keep it up to date, it will, um, it, it's, it's pretty impossible because every time you have to watch out for the breaking changes, you're going to be breaking your code a lot. So I just, I just suggest that you, every time you update the dependency, especially with breaking changes, that you have a good reason for this. Um, so I wanted to show, talk, uh, I wanted to uh, show a common example with this very, very simple snippet of code. This is, uh, this is a code, this is a snippet which uses, uh, which I use um, when I use the JSS library, which is essentially just writing CSS and JavaScript. So here we have a style sheet with a class called toolbar, and inside we have a margin uh, where top and bottom are 10 pixels and left and right are auto. So let's say that for every reason we are no longer allowed to use this array syntax. Let's say that it, uh, there's supposed to breaking change in JSS and they no longer allow it. We have to convert it to a string, which in this case is fairly simple. Uh, you just um, con uh, convert it to a string and you add the pixel, pixel next to numbers. But in case we have a uh, variable, uh, this becomes a bit more complicated. For example, this means that on the left right um, you have the value of whatever the space and unit is in your theme. So, when you want to convert it to a string, it will be much more complicated. You don't have to use template literals, but it's, it's nicer, nicer to read. But you have to 
add the 10 pixels and then you have to interpolate the variable and add pixels on, at the end. I don't know if this is possible using a simple regex, uh, maybe it is, but it's not going to be fun. Why? Because regex don't, does, don't understand the syntax of the code. Which is why I wanted to introduce you with the concept of abstract syntax tree, which is a representation uh, of your code structure. I wanted to show you how this looks like exactly. Uh, can you all see it? Let's say. Uh, this is the example that we're going to use. Uh, this is the code that we're going to use uh, when we are writing our code mode. This is the style sheet, which is input. And this is the output, expected output. So you see that we have arrays here, and we have uh, strings here. And we have three cases, A, B, and C. So this is something that you're going to probably use a lot, if you, whether you're writing uh, code modes, or you're uh, contributing to Babel, or, any, or ESLint. When I, when I, um, I'm just going to zoom, zoom out a bit. When I uh, put my cursor on here, you see that uh, it focused the part of the AST uh, which has the type of literal. And under the value, we have 10, like here. Let's, let's focus on this auto. And we also have a literal, but this is the value of auto. Uh, in, in here, it's uh, more, more, much more complicated. Wow, this, this looks terrible. Um, I think this, oh, this works. Um, you put the unit and it's an identifier which has the name unit and it's a part of a member expression and, and so on. It's a bit more complicated. So this is something that is very valuable. It's a, it's a tool, it's okay. It's a tool called AST Explorer. And it's, it's so useful, I use it all the time. And it even has, um, it even has a utility for JS code shift, which I'm not going to go into today, but just so you know that it exists. Um, okay. So what are code modes? They are um, they're scripts for refactoring your code. They are just node scripts, so written in node. Uh, which take as an input your source code and it, they also take uh, the JS code shift API and they, they change whatever and they output a new source. They use an AST, they understand the syntax of your code and uh, more, uh, more importantly they are easily testable. So when you write a code mode, you don't have to run it across your entire code base all the time and revert it all the time because you're going to make a lot of mistakes at the beginning, just so you can uh, see whether you are correct or not. You can just write the uh, input file uh, and the output, the expected output, and you will run tests and it, it, each time it will compare whether they match. Uh, it has a command line utility, which you just type JS code shift and a dash T, T for transform. The first argument is the code mode file. Uh, this is the actual script that changes your uh, file. And the second argument is target. The target can be either a file or, or a folder. The folder, if it's a folder, then it will uh, run this script across all the files in that folder. The pros, the pros of, um, of code modes is that you can iterate your ideas faster. I think the most annoying, one of the most annoying points of uh, front-end developer is that ideas change so fast, they are good, uh, good patterns to good practices. For example, those of you who are React developers, remember, uh, remember those higher order components? They're gone, they're gone in like two months or something, now it's all about random props. And uh, we, it's hard to keep up with all these uh, new trends. And this is what code modes uh, allow you to do. You are no longer forced to look at your old bad practices just because it's uh, expensive time-wise to update your code all the time. Also, uh, you can stay more up-to-date with your dependencies, which is always good because dependencies can have, um, dependencies can have uh, 
I don't know, performance improvements or uh, better syntax and so on. Also, when you can uh, write your code not once, and then you can uh, execute it on as many files as you want. Uh, for example, in manual refactoring, it really depends on how many files you have because that's the amount that it will take you to refactor all of this. But with the code mode, you can just run it across one project, across multiple projects, it doesn't matter. One example of this, a collection of code modes, is uh, called the JS code mode, which is a collection of very simple um, code modes that transform your code to next generation JavaScript. Three examples uh, is uh, a code mode which, uh, which change your regular functions into error functions, or you, you want to get rid of all the var statements because now it's constant let. Or you want to uh, change all the <coughs> strings which you uh, concatenate with a class, you want to convert them all to a template literal. One example of the template literal was visible when I first showed you that example of uh, stash. Another example is from the React team. Uh, it's called React Code Mode. And it's a collection of code modes that uh, help you update to newer versions of React API. One example, is, uh, a few example is the pure component class that you can instead, uh, extend instead of uh, writing the shoot component update method where you shall only compare your state and props. Uh, other, other two are error boundaries or uh, removing the, removing the deprecated find on node um, function. And this is a good example because you can see that if you are uh, author of a library and you want to introduce some breaking changes because you made some, some decisions that you no longer hold and you want to update it, but there is also this aspect that, you, that, every of you, uh, that your users now have to change their code in order to update. And if you write a code mode that your users can just uh, run across their code bases and update to update those breaking changes. This is uh, kind of this is very cool because you are more free to introduce more breaking changes. So let's try. Uh, let's see a code mode for our style sheet example. I have it already written. I'm not going to do much like live coding. So this is a very, very simple project. It only has two dependencies. Nobody has seen such a project before. It has, uh, it has JS uh, for testing and JS code shift, which, uh, which, does, uh, which runs code modes. And I created this code mode. I'll just find this one in a bit. It has this uh, code mode subfolder, um, which is where the code modes are uh, placed. This is one code mode. We have only one. In this example, um, and this is like very just a dozen lines of code to, to show you as an example. And this is the important part where you define uh, you define the input file and the expected output file. So you see here, like we had in the J A ASD Explorer, we have this array stuff, and then this is the output uh, JS file, which uh, which shows the what, what you expect. And the, this, the, uh, here you define your tests, and this is usually it will only take you two lines because just code shift exports this defined test utility, which you just run, and it has written the test for you. What it does is that it runs your code mode on this input JS file, and it compares the output with this expected output file, and it shows it shows you whether they match or not, and how they differ if they don't. Let's uh, try to run these tests. This is expected. It failed. Uh, over here at the top, it says that it failed because it, it, uh, the input and output don't match. Uh, and over here, bot bottom is the more useful part, is the difference between the, the actual output and the expected output. You, we can see that in the A example, it was uh, correct. It output 10 pixels and 20 pixels. But in this case, in the B example, it says 10 pixels and output pixels. 
So let's see why this happened. Let's see the actual code mode script. This is the function that I was telling you about earlier. It takes the file source and the API from uh, JS code shift. Here, um, I'm just call it this. Here, uh, it, this, this is what converts your file source into AST. And then we find all variable declarators which has the name of style sheet. So in this example, it's this one. So we, in here, we assume that all of our style sheets will have the exact same name and that we aren't going to use this name for anything else, which might be a dangerous assumption in, in some other project, but in, it's, here it's fine. And then the next, th the next thing that we do is that we find inside of this uh, variable declaration, we find all array instances. And we replace them with a literal that we've seen here. Um, this one. Literal, which where we define the value inside of these parentheses. And we create a value by reducing all of the array elements into one string. And here you might notice a problem. That here we are just blindly appending px regardless of what the value is, regardless of what the element, uh, what the uh, array element is. So let's try checking the type of element value. If it's a number, then we append px. Otherwise, we're going to assume that it's a string and uh, output it as is. So let's run the test again. Now it fails again, as expected. But you can see here that the b example now passes. Uh, it recognized that it's a string and it didn't append px to it. The C example, which is much more complicated, which, uh, which you have to put the template literal or, or whatever, has some weird undefined thing, which is something that we see often in JavaScript. Uh, but we're not going to go into that because uh, forming, uh, forming the node of template literal is much more complicated. So it's, it's out of the scope for this presentation. But I just wanted to show you how um, what the process of uh, making it uh, more and more complex what it looks like. The cons of code modes is that, as you've seen, it can have many many uh, variations, each with a different AST, which can be a bit frustrating because often you type the same things in different ways. And uh, it's, it can be frustrating because, um, because you don't catch all the cases and you have to decide uh, whether it caught enough cases. Maybe if you're left with only like five cases, you can uh, do them manually. And the rest of it, it's, it's, um, it's, you fix it automatically. The second, a bit discouraging thing, is that uh, it, it just called shift is current, like a bit of documentation. But the, tool that, the tools that it builds on have enough documentation and actually reading the source of JS code shift will help, help you understand more of its API. And this is coming from a guy who hates reading source code, so that's, that's encouraging. Um, the third thing is that, like, th this is what I wanted to emphasize the most, is that if you never had any experience with ASD, i.e., uh, that is if you never contributed to Babel or contributed to ASLint, it's going to be a big learning curve. And uh, in my case, it took me twice as, mo twice as long for my first code mod than it would take me if I, uh, if I did it manually. But this is a very, very useful skill to, to do because uh, your code base might be just huge and uh, manually updating it will not even be an option because it will have so much code that it's, it's just not feasible. But if you get a hang of code, uh, code, code notes, then it will, be, um, it will be great. And I know that many programmers have this um, urge to complete something before the day is over. And this is the part where I wanted to say, you just, uh, just be patient and uh, go to sleep and try again tomorrow. Because, uh, because you will probably not get it at first, but you'll get it the second day, and the next one, and the next one, and you'll get a hang of it eventually. 
I just wanted to show you in this short presentation just how um, powerful this tool can be. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Do you have any questions for me? Okay, go. Uh -huh, yes. Uh, so, as you say, as a big organizer, and we show that some small repositories, for example, but is there such a thing as a bigger registry of this content with this tool? Because it would be useful. Many cases are so common that people would need to do them over and over again without uh, writing them. There are multiple uh, repositories with code modes. I, I, I don't know them by, like, right in my mind right now, but I've seen many of them, and they're just like people People write them because they are so useful. Like you said, there are um, more repositories with very useful code modes. Uh, have I? Are you using uh, code modes in production? Code modes in production. Uh, not right now because I'm still in the phase of uh, getting the hang of it. Are you still learning? Yes, I'm still learning. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, so How this... How much time would it take to, like, brainstorm? So, like, uh, you know, uh, How much time did it take me to? To brainstorm, so to, to know it, how to do it, and to be from the debate to you know how to make sound and everything. Well, uh, I had previous uh, experience with uh, contributing to ESLint. So I'm very, uh, I was familiar already with ASD, so that's, that's, uh, that factor uh, makes this uh, estimation of how long it, will, it took me a bit harder. But uh, I'm, I, I, it's, it's not only did I not fully grasp it, but it's a very, very young tool. So it's, it's something that's still like very young and I would say even a bit experimental. So. Um, but it's, it pays off really when you, when you have to use it for a large purpose. And, um, but I, I have to admit that it was so frustrating to me at the beginning, especially because you think that it will save you time. And, uh, and, and, and when you do it the first time, it looks like it, you just spend a lot of time trying to do it automatically, like other things that you try to automatize, automatize and it ends up being for longer than it would. But uh, I got a hang of it, and it was very useful to do. Yeah, it actually looks like golf piping to me, you know? So, this stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it has a chain. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you do this, 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 and then this. Yeah, so and, and this example that I showed, turning arrays into uh, strings, it's a very, very uh, simplified example. You can also, like, move move uh, things completely to another places, as long as the change is consistent. As long as you're consistently doing one practice and you want to change this pattern to a completely different pattern. And that's, so that's very useful, just at, as a, when you make um, when you make a decision as a team to do something and then you want to change that decision, this is a tool which makes this change, change very, uh, much more easy. Yeah, but I think that the best thing is actually for the library builders to make breaking changes. You know, you just make a break change and you uh, like make this code mode and you ship it. And yeah. Exactly. It's, that's it's, a very direct. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's most useful for yeah, library yeah. builders. So yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Matia. So. <laughs> yeah, so we continue. TypeScript and React.
so let's start. Uh, so, hello everybody, uh, my name is Herbo, and I'm going to talk today about the TypeScript and how you can use it with uh, React. I'm a lead developer at CSFit, and we use this uh, stack quite often and to a great effect uh, because it uh, makes our uh, managing of large projects much easier uh, because we are more certain that our code is uh, up to date and, and it's, it's all, all right. So, uh, I'm going to start my presentation with uh, what is TypeScript and some basic uh, usage and how we can use types in it. Uh, then, I'm going to talk to, uh, talk to you a bit about flow and TypeScript and what the differences are and if you're going to use what. And then, I'm going to do a little React TypeScript demo so you can see that it's uh, not hard to, to set up your project to use TypeScript with React. So, what is TypeScript? TypeScript is actually just a superset language. For the JavaScript. So we, this is an uh, old image that you can see on the internet because it only has ES6 and ES5. But uh, the basic premise is that you use uh, TypeScript. You have all the JavaScript features in it, but uh, you get uh, a lot of features on top of the JavaScript uh, that, you, that you can have. Uh, TypeScript is uh, updated monthly, so every every month there is a new update and some new features come to the language. So you, you can uh, you have to keep up with it. Like, uh, refactoring a lot of it because uh, sometimes they introduce breaking changes, but it's, uh, it's great because you get all the cool new uh, features. Uh, it's maintained by the Microsoft, so they are trying. It's an open source project. You can go to GitHub and see all the see all the all the code that, that's that uh, behind TypeScript, uh, and they are listening to the community when, when it comes to the new features that are going to be introduced. But at the end of the day, it's only Microsoft, so not all the Features are in yet and are. Uh, Would you just like to present more? Ah, uh -huh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's good. Uh, so it's only Microsoft, so uh, they are listening to the community on, on this one, but you have to be really loud to get your favorite features in of a uh, new printout. So, how does the TypeScript work? Well, it's a pretty uh, simple, if you ask me. So all, all you have to do is uh, use a TypeScript compiler to compile all your TypeScript code to the JavaScript code, and that's the thing that uh, your browser is gonna uh, is gonna run in in the browser. Yeah. So uh, you can configure your uh, TypeScript compiler using a psconfig file. Uh, so you have all the all the options, all the rules, so you can configure it to your needs. I would suggest if you are doing some migration from the old JavaScript to new types uh, to TypeScript, you may want to turn off a few rules because all your code is not going to compile so you don't get anything but if you're starting a new project it's, it's a better approach to use all as many rules as you can because then you uh, use all the features that TypeScript is uh, giving you and the important thing to talk about uh, when we talk about TypeScript is this type definitions that in that DS uh, files because uh, uh, that's the way that you, if you are building your library that's the way you can uh, enable other users other uh, developers to use your Code natively inside the inside the TypeScript, so it's it's important to uh, configure your compiler to produce you the uh, these type definitions. So, uh, what are the basic features that uh, TypeScript brings uh, over the JavaScript? So it's types. It's called TypeScript. It's types. So you get the types. Uh, these are uh, some of the basic types. You can create your own types by using interfaces or uh, classes or even generics. Uh, interfaces and classes are inter inter interesting, especially for the React developers, because uh, you can uh, leverage them to, to write your code more reliably, and I'm going to show you later on. And also generics, it's, it's a nice tool to have because you don't want to write your code over and over again. You can just write it once and it works um, on, a set of, uh, on a set of classes types that you already uh, specified. So uh, with that, I'm going to go into a little demo of uh, syntax of TypeScript and what it does. So if you go inside the you go to Google and just Google TypeScript, you can get this uh, nice page that you go and you can check out all the documentation and release notes and release notes so you can be uh, up to date. And there is a, a nice feature on this website. It's called Displayground. Uh, it, it basically uh, shows you what the TypeScript is going to produce when uh, when you compile your code to JavaScript. It's also a great uh, tool to use if you want to test some 
features of TypeScript to see how it works. You don't have to set up your project and everything. You just go here and uh, use it. So I'm going to use it uh, to showcase uh, some of the some of the features. And the first thing I want to do is that I want to enable all the rules because I want my TypeScript compiler to warn me about any uh, stuff that are not good. So this, and so I'm going to start with a simple uh, example of uh, using interfaces. So uh, there is a keyword interface. And I'm going to make an interface student. <coughs> and then I can define the uh, properties that, that my uh, interface is going to have. So uh, let's say I want to have a name, and I'm going to declare it to be a string. So I'm telling the TypeScript comp okay, it must be a string. I'm telling my uh, TypeScript compiler that my name is uh, of type string, so it's going to enforce that for me, and I'm going to put surname here as well. So I get, uh, and it's going to also be a string. So as you can see, this is a uh, TypeScript um, feature. Nothing uh, on the right, right, right hand side. Nothing is translated still to compile to JavaScript. But if I want to use, uh, let's say, const uh, mark as a uh, student, I can see that something is happening on the right hand side, and I'm gonna uh, assign it some value. And the first thing that you can notice is that uh, uh, my uh, IDE actually is informing me that something is wrong, and it's a great feature of, of TypeScript that it's uh, supported on a lot of uh, IDEs. So uh, I have to have a name. Right? It's, it's pretty straightforward, so I'm going to give it a name, and I'm going to say Mark. And it's still informing me that surname is missing, so I'm going to add a surname. Surname, yeah, Mark. And now the uh, TypeScript compiler is happy, and this is all I get uh, out of the JavaScript side. So, uh, uh, but uh, common common uh, developer practice is to change your interface. So I'm gonna add a new name to the interface, and then uh, TypeScript compiler will warn me, and this will not comply. Uh, compile. So you get the uh, you get the compile time error uh, error, which is a great error to have. It's much better than having a runtime error. And also what's interesting, especially to us uh, React developers, is I want to make uh, this property to be optional, and so that I just put a uh, question mark, so this means that uh, this property can, can be or cannot be. And as you can see, it means that the uh, nickname is either string or undefined. And then I can use autocomplete here to have my uh, nickname, and I'm gonna, I can give it a nickname, so it's MF. So these are, this is a basic uh, interface stuff. So as you can see, on the right hand side, it's just got some variable and nothing important. Uh, but I want to copy up some code that I've written to show you uh, uh, other other uh, features, uh, some basic features. So if I click so I'm going to copy it here. And as you can see, there is a lot of things that uh, JavaScript, the types of compiler So uh, I'm going to. Uh, make an, another interface called room, and I'm gonna instantiate it with let. And so I have a enum. So enum uh, are, uh, if you're familiar with it, from the backend side, uh, it's a set of uh, values that your variable can take. And it's a great tool because uh, the enums in TypeScript are quite pow powerful because you can get uh, either a string or a number as your backend type. So uh, if I alert this as a room full, I'm going to get this uh, string. And if I go to the TypeScript, uh, JavaScript side of it, JavaScript side, I get this snippet of code uh, that's, that is being produced for me. So as you can see, it's uh, it's making an object and it's not assigning it and stuff like that. So uh, this is also great if you do a Redux de uh, development because uh, you get, uh, sorry, because uh, you, can, uh, you can use these ends to define your uh, React Redux actions, and, and, and in a sense, you can enforce uh, type safety even in Redux uh, if, you, if you want. So I'm gonna be, uh, the other stuff I want to show you is the classes. So you uh, you create class the same way we do in the ES6 uh, syntax. So you can have your uh, modifiers as a private, protected, or uh, public. So public means I can use it from everywhere. Private means I can use it only in the class, and protected means I can use it in only in derived. And here I instantiate one uh, lecture, so it's, and the only thing I can access is the register from uh, lecture, and if I try to access any of these other stuff, uh, I will not be able to do that. So, uh, and uh, also I can extend classes the same way, so I can uh, 
we have some, have some hierarchy or something, I register uh, lecture and uh, the syntax is this, and I can assign additional properties or use uh, basic types. Um, uh, one other thing I want to show you as a cool uh, feature, so if I click this line, which is, uh, which is substantially been registered as right this, types of compiler will warn me that something is wrong because uh, I, I never assigned any values to this register as this. So it's a great way also to get a compile time error instead of running it in, uh, in a, let's say, production in this register as this, being undefined and everything crashes. So it, it's a great way. Uh, it's a great way to, to catch your uh, errors earlier, and also if I don't return anything from my uh, from my uh, function, which I define to return this m, so this is the syntax. If I want to say uh, my uh, my function will return something, and it's warning me uh, that the function wants sending return statement, and uh, so it, it warns you even even of that. Also, it warns you if I lose if I return two, it's going to warn me that it's a bad, bad uh, type of return, so it's giving me a type safety so I can be sure what I've returned from the, from the function. So, uh, that's all the basic stuff I wanted to show you. I'm going to just jump into my uh, slide deck for a bit, and then I'm going to go to the... Okay, so it should be my... Uh, okay, so I want to talk uh, a bit about the TypeScript and flow and how they come. Uh, compare. So these are both solutions that bring uh, the types to your uh, JavaScript code, and Flow is uh, more focused in, in a sense that it only brings types to your code and some other uh, small things. While the TypeScript has this broader approach and it's, going, and it's trying to solve a lot of problems, which is uh, which can be good, but sometimes it's not because Flow is uh, has a better type safety. So if you are introducing types, you want your language to be type safe. Type safe, but uh, uh, TypeScript is taking a pragmatic approach to the problem, and sometimes it's gonna fail, and that's the worst thing that can happen to you because it fails when you are expecting it not to fail. Flow has uh, similar problems, but it's better in, in, in that in, in that sense. And it also has, it has some uh, nice features that are not in uh, TypeScript yet, like TypeScript, which is which is really nice. On the other hand, TypeScript has a better ID integration. I showed you. Uh, in on the website, it's actually running a Visual Studio Code map project, so you get a great integration and autocomplete and, and stuff like that. And it's all uh, it's it's the same for all the all the tools that we use. Like Sublime has a great plugin, uh, Visual Studio Code, of course, and Visual Studio. But they are Microsoft products, so it's uh, kind of expected. But uh, Atom has also a great uh, plugin, so uh, you get a better ID integration, and that's a that's a big deal because uh, then it's more uh, nice to write your code, you feel uh, better. Uh, we have also bigger typing uh, library on the TypeScript side, and that's a big, big deal because uh, you cannot use uh, third-party libraries if you don't have these type definitions, especially if they are written in JavaScript, so type definitions are just some header files that describe your code to the TypeScript compiler. And uh, TypeScript has a great project called Type Definitions, so you can get uh, all the types for all the, all the more popular libraries uh, if they are not supplied by the li library creator. So, for example, Redux is uh, already shipping TypeScript definitions uh, by default with their, with their library, but React, for example, is not. So, uh, there is a big typing library, and I'm going to show you how to use it, and it's uh, really nice and easy to use and uh, consume. And it also has a nice documentation as far as official documentation goes. Uh, I showed you the, 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 uh, the, <laughs> the website, and uh, the types, uh, types of documentation is quite nice, actually. And there's a lot of material on the internet uh, to find. If you, uh, if you run into some problems, you can solve it quite easy with the help of other people that they contributed. So, uh, my opinion about TypeScript and Flow is that you can use both. It's it's a great uh, it's great that you're use, using types, especially for the large project, because it, it gives you some safety during your refactorings and stuff like that. Uh, I, I chose we choose uh, the TypeScript because uh, it has a better ID integration. That's the biggest, biggest thing for us because everything runs so smooth and, and it's great. But Flow is also nice, and I think it's uh, up to your flavor or what you like most. You like Facebook. Like Microsoft and stuff like that, but I think both are good at what they do. So, 
how do we uh, write React in TypeScript? So the first thing that you notice is that uh, extension is different. So it's not it's, uh, it's not JS six now. It's T six uh, as a file extension, and that's the biggest difference. So uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, backpack loader, as I think is a it's an important uh, issue to, to, to bring up because there is uh, currently two good uh, uh, backpack loaders for uh, TypeScript. So the first is TS loader I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, that's uh, actually Microsoft built uh, loader uh, which is quite official. But there is a community driven effort around awesome TypeScript loader which is actually better. Um, in my experience, uh, it works better with a large number of files. So if you have a large number of files, you may want to switch to awesome TypeScript loader. It also has a bubble integration so you can use some script or some bubble integration that you like. And actually it sometimes supports a new version more fast, faster because uh, for example we were doing some uh, migration from TypeScript 1.9 to 2.1 and we were doing Webpack from 1.1 to 2 and uh, TS loader at the time had a bug that didn't support this configuration so it was, uh, we were glad that we were using those awesome TypeScript loader at that point. Just just works. And also the thing I want to talk about is uh, linting because uh, even though TypeScript is great at protecting you from some uh, common mistakes, it's also very nice to have your linter, a linter inside there. There is a thing, uh, you get a TS lint JSON where you uh, write your rules that you, that you want to follow, uh, so it's great. Uh, and even if, and if you're doing a React development, you write, uh, uh, you can Use TSLint React as a nice library that brings some of the uh, rules that your uh, team members and you yourself have to obey. Also, there is a great library made by Airbnb that is also bringing their TSLint rules and also Microsoft, so you can uh, modify it uh, to your needs. And I'm going to show it later how it will help you uh, avoid some common common pitfalls. Also, you can write your custom rules if you're in it. So this is uh, so uh, I'm going to now go into a demo. So I'm going to show you how it works actually. So um, first, this is my demo uh, application. So I, uh, I set up a classic uh, classic uh, project. So I have my package JSON, and my package JSON also is not that large. Like I have 20 maybe or something plus uh, dependencies. And as you can see, I have my uh, webpack, I have my TypeScript, and I have my TS and stuff like that, and I have my React. Uh, the first thing I want to point out to you is uh, this. So this is this is uh, the thing that I was talking about. These are the types definitions that I need for my React. Because if I don't have these types, I cannot use. Uh, I can use uh, React in, in my TypeScript application, but this makes it so much easier. And so uh, I have to find this. So uh, I'm going to show it to you. So if I so, uh, it works uh, really simple. So, if you have a library that you installed into your application, all you can do is npm install add types and just write the name of your library here, and most probably you're going to get it. Like uh, the, uh, uh, in, in the last couple of months, I never encountered a, li a library that didn't have types definition. But the, that changed from before, but now it's, uh, it's up to date, so you can find uh, your types there. Uh, I have to warn you that some type definitions are not so good, so they are not 100% uh, the same that they should be, but most of them are updating regularly. Also, you can write your own if you, if you, if you like. So, uh, these are my package JSON, so I'm going to just jump into my web config to see that there's nothing uh, interesting here going. So, I have my uh, TSLint loader and I have my awesome TypeScript loader, and that's what it is. Uh, same lines of code. So the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, add a new file, so let's call it a student, uh, and I have to uh, name it TS6, so it knows it's a, it's a TypeScript, so I have to import everything as React from React, it's auto-completing for me, which is nice. So uh, I'm going to just, uh, when I start to develop my uh, React components, usually I want to define its props first, of like what, what is my component capable of doing, and for that I'm going to use uh, interface. 
which is a nice, uh, a nice typescape feature that I can use. So I can save to then props, and I'm gonna just copy it from before. So I have my name and I have my surname. Okay, happy. So I type this. So uh, and I want this to be a relatively dumb component, and I want it to be a functional component. So I can write this const student. So I want to export it first, const student, and I'm going to say it's of type. So this is the syntax, it's of type. And uh, uh, TypeScript is giving me options to, uh, to autocomplete to see what's actually inside of the React uh, module. So I'm going to use SFC. Uh, this means that it's a functional component, and I'm going to just put, uh, and I'm going to tell it. Uh, And I'm going to tell it uh, for my props, please use student props. So, so I can have my nice auto completion. And I'm going to say it's uh, just a function of props that is returning some, uh, it's returning some uh, GS6 element. So I have to return the yeah. So I'm going to do. So this is it, and uh, then I can use something like this. I can use props that, and it's going to give me all the props that I can use. So it's giving me all the properties because I define it here that it's a, that is that that's what the props are. So it's it's really nice, and I get out of completion which I love very much. So I'm going to do I it's me props that name. So it's everything that I want to use. And I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say that this is optional because actually I'm not using it in my, uh, in my own. So that, 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 that's nice. Mm -hmm. And next thing I want to do, I want to create some uh, class based, uh, class -based uh, components. So I do it similar. Import React. And then I'm gonna do the same thing again. To show you some other good, good stuff, this is, this is actually uh, so I'm doing that like this. Again, I'm uh, making my interface, so it's a vector drops, and uh, I'm doing it like this. So I have to, I want to my have students for my lecture. So I'm going to say it's an array. So I can use array uh, of type student props, for example, and it's even uh, allowing me to out of import this stuff. So it's telling me import student props for from I don't think from here. So it, it's out importing this stuff. So you have to find it and you have to, you don't have to write this code for yourself. And I'm gonna say lecture name is a student. So it's it's a it's easy and you get your auto completion and your auto importing. So I can do uh, export uh, I can do my component export lecture and I'm gonna sorry, it's class, class which extends uh, react that, and I can use it again. But now it's a it's a more narrow, uh, uh, it's, it's a smaller set of things that I can do with it that it's going to be a uh, type of value stuff. So I'm gonna do a cube component, of course, and I'm gonna say to it, uh, please use lecture props as a uh, type for my props, and uh, don't use any state. So it's a, this is a syntax that can be, you can use if you don't want to have a state in this uh, component. And then I do a public renderer, and it's it's all already uh, letting me do it. And the thing I like to do when I'm writing my render method is to declare that it's going to return a gsec that element, which means that it's going to return something uh, for uh, React in this way. And I'm going to do the same thing again. They return me something. So what I want to show here as well is uh, TypeScript. As, as I said, it's uh, updating monthly. So they had a day one support of the new, the new React. Uh, uh, so you can use something like this. So you can make this program because just because I can. And then I'm gonna do uh, 
this without props. As you can see, it's giving me everything on this, uh, on this component because you can see all, all the things that I have, but I, I have to use props. I want to use props, and I can okay, say my lecture name, and I can say, uh, I want you to do this for me, props, uh, that students, and I I get all the all the uh, methods and functions I can use over my uh, over my array, and I'm gonna do this. Why? So, and I just want to use my student here, for example, student. So it's it auto import it from from student as it knows that what that's what I want, and I'm gonna just put student because everything is there, and I'm gonna do this. So I can use my props, and it's going to auto-complete, so I, have to, I can use my name, it's, uh, it's auto-completion, and I just put it, uh, I'm going to say it's uh, as uh, name also, I get this. And you can see something is informing that something is wrong. So I have my TSM set up, so it checks for key property. So I don't want to, I don't want to react to informing in the, in the runtime that something is wrong with my code, so I have my TSM calculated this way. And I just say P is it's really nice I. So everything is okay. As you can see, uh, I declared the student props surname as optional, so it's not informing that something is missing. If I delete this, uh, something is wrong because I cannot have my uh, my component working without this property. So I just put name, and I do this. I can get the surname and I can put it in uh, as as I want. So everything is fine. But if I put two here, of course, it's going to warn me that something is wrong, and that's all. That's the way uh, the passing of props works in the in the in this in, in, in that. So I have to save this file, and I'm going to go to the. And then I'm going to go into my index six, and there I have everything set up already. So I'm using it from demo student. So I'm going So I'm using the yeah, the property, but if I do this, I can get my auto So it sees everything that is ported from that module, and uh, that's great. And it's warning me that my student props are from the wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> so that I do that a lot, and that's why I love the. What did I do? No, no, no. You know, lecture report, lecture spelling. Ah, okay. Oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah, freaking dirty. Freaking dirty. So, oh, it's, it's not lecture name anymore, it's a lecture name. So, as you can see, it, it informs me of my bad typing skills, which is great, actually. So, I do this, I save this, so everything is fine. I do my npm start, and on the on the uh, by the bills, I want to show you something else. So, uh, if I want to use uh, default props or even context types, I have to uh, use it like this. So, it's a static property over the over the class. So, I have to uh, declare it that way. Public static. Uh, uh, let, uh, let's say the props, uh, and I have to declare the type. And I'm going to say partial. Partial means it does not have to be a complete object of some type. So I'm going to use lecture props here, of course. So uh, and and it's uh, it's and it's not informing me that something is wrong. And I have my auto completion again. I can like say lecture name is uh, is equals to this. Uh, so I can use it like this, and I can use my uh, public also public static context type. Type for my uh, context, and the same thing is with this uh, uh, with this uh, uh, function component. But it's even nicer there because I can use to then that, and it's going to give me all the stuff that I can uh, do over it. So I have context types, and I get people props uh, more more easily if you want to use it, and if you want to use the uh, context in your inside your uh, inside your uh, functional component, you just do it 
that one and everything you need. I didn't say anything, so I can show you that it just works. So I get first this case, me mark K, me steamen, and everything is working. See, I'm a great CSS guy, so that's what we get. So uh, I'm gonna return to my slide deck and see that thing power of mine does it. Why? So I'm gonna do this. And uh, I'm gonna go, go to my conclusion. So what's a what's a big uh, pro for uh, TypeScript? It's very suitable for large projects because, uh, uh, as you can see, it protects me as a developer from my mistyping. It protects me during my refactoring and stuff like that. Uh, it's uh, it's great as, as my code is more robust and I can uh, I can delegate some of my responsibility to the TypeScript compiler, which I like. So it's great. It's also great that you can use almost every library on the internet. <laughs> there is a lot of modules of JavaScript and I can use it in TypeScript, but it's also really, really nice. So, uh, that would be my uh, conclusion. It's a nice technology, it's uh, quite mature now, so you can use it in your, in your project and get some something. So, thank you for your patience and uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. No, no, because because uh, we fall back to the TypeScript for that. So. Um, do we happen to know? Um, you have a TS config file, right? Yeah. Uh, do we happen to know like why does it have, uh, why is it cons uh, why is that concept like a separate builder? Why isn't uh, it more integrated with, for example, Babel or something? This is something that was so weird to me when I tried to introduce. TypeScript, like I think only recently in Web 7 there is a, there is a plugin for TypeScript. Why is it like such a separate thing? I don't know, but if I if I can guess, it's because of Microsoft because they, they did it. All, all, all. It's quite old actually, but it has, it has been around some time. They didn't uh, they they wanted to be just theirs, like so they have yes one that does not play with anything. I but that would be my guess. So if I get if I add some experimental technology like something that isn't part of the um, that isn't part of the standard license, the atmosphere to whatever, would it work? Yeah, it would work, especially if you use it with a uh, awesome TypeScript loader because it allows you to use experimental features from ES actually because you can combine the TS config and, and the bubble together to, so so they can work. <laughs> because I didn't show it there, but uh, you, you can. I, I have it. I, actually, I have it somewhere because uh, in TS config you can put in uh, the awesome TypeScript properties <coughs> that you want to use, so you can use bubble and stuff like that. Because uh, when I first done this uh, this thing, you see, I have Babel core as my as my uh, dependency. I, I was doing this fast, and I had the, the awesome TypeScript loader feature on because we use it. Actually, we use that. That same scenario, use something for Babel where you compile the TypeScript. Yes, you can do it, but you have to use also TypeScript compiler for that. Yeah, yes. um, okay. uh, you said like this is uh, very mature now and everything, but uh, in the beginning you said like uh, they're, they're introducing uh, many breaking changes and stuff and updating every month. So why is that then? What's, uh, what's because, being updated? Because they are, they are pushing all the yes next, let's say yes to yes next features inside the inside the TypeScript, so mm -hmm. it's breaking it mm -hmm. actually uh, along the way. So you get all the new cool features, but you get all the breaking changes because I think uh, when we work, we, we are using 2.3, but as you, you saw, it's 2.72 now. Mm -hmm. So like we, we, we couldn't follow it because we will have to. Rise and mm -hmm. But the biggest change was, I guess, from 1 to 2, that was, that was the major and some, some stuff in 2.1 were also breaking changes. But there, there is not a lot of breaking changes now, as far as I know. Okay, cool. Do you know if it would be uh, easy to transition a large code base to TypeScript? I missed the very beginning, so you might have said this, but to transition. 
additional large COVID TypeScript incrementally while still using the ES line and whatever other loaders are always better? I guess you could do it, especially if you, uh, I, I, I don't that, uh, if you, if you uh, lower your uh, TypeScript compiler rules so it does not follow everything, then you can write almost JavaScript code if you like, so you can do uh, gradual transition and also you can do, yeah, I guess you could use, but you would have to use the uh, type definitions for the code that's outside of JavaScript and it can be a bit of a pain. Uh, I just wanted to want to answer the question. We actually positioned the field in code base from IS6 to TypeScript, and yeah, you will turn out some things like you allow implicit things, and then you just improve as you go along, works fine, helps from the very beginning. Okay, oh, yeah, okay. Is there any more questions? Uh, I would just have, uh, so it's probably better to work, uh, to have a, a beginning for ES6 at least, and then so when you revise to ES6, you revise for uh, one time, so when I have a code that Yeah, so I had a problem, so I did actually flow, I tried to introduce flow into my project, but the problem was that the React Redux Connect stuff, you know, yeah. you use it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it didn't pass the props into the component, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it was lost somewhere, you know, during this, like, tree, whatever you want to call it, you know? You don't have these problems here? No. That so you use this Redux connector? Yeah, yeah we, we use it. And you just define like this props, like you yeah. this and everything works? Yeah. yeah that's pretty cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my, yeah, I had like really big problems and I was like Googling it and it was like, you need to do this, 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 oh, and maybe you will see something. And I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'm not ready to move this to like flow. And this, yeah, actually is pretty cool. Yeah, it works. Yeah, because I'm like really disappointed. We have all these um, prop types defined, so all of our components have prop types, and we don't do anything with them, you know? So that's like waste of lines of code, you know? So yeah, this makes it very, very better. Yeah. What? Your file student Okay, yeah. Let me just jump to it. So, who's the benefit? So functional components, yeah. yeah but, so why not just uh, annotating props with the student props? I don't understand. Why so, instead of, so why not just instead of uh, annotating props with the like, style? Like this? Like, you were asking why is it declared here? So, yeah, props. yeah uh, because uh, in, in the, I'm going to show you the source code so you can understand. So what, what it does for me is it is uh, injecting me uh, children as a, as a mandatory uh, React probe inside this variable. And if I declare it as a student probe, then I'm going to lose it. So that's why if you're using this, uh, don't ever put, put your type here. Because if, uh, the children the children properties probe will be lost. Because you, if I put, like, let's say this. I do props that children, and then I declare my student props or the props, and then I get this nice little error that children is not supporting. Can you extend interface? Uh, yes, yes. Could you extend interface with Yeah, yeah I, I could, but uh, uh, that, that's additional coding that I have to do, and uh, React is already doing it for me because this is not correct actually. Because these uh, probes do have a children property because of that's how they get also. But I, I think a uh, workaround was just to add the children as uh, option. Yeah, yeah, I, I could yeah. do that, but but I I, I don't want to because uh, the typings are doing it for me. Maybe just to add to this, you want your student component to be on this side. You don't want your probes to be on the student probes. I think that but doesn't mean. The, the, yeah, but the, 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 the function is important. So, by inferring the graph, 
it's fine because it's returning the yes, it's, it's element. Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's not about React. I think maybe just about your uh, about your logic in code and everything. You need your React component that gets these props and it's extended with everything else that React has. So if they make some changes so in the future, you immediately see that here. You don't need to drag the React and something more to the children or anything like that. So, but uh, I'm not sure. But it, I mean, it's just running the children. Problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and that, that, that's 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 a major benefit because I can I can use children if I don't specify the because all the inference you actually are part of this advantage. There is no. Okay, are there any more questions? We can continue to talk. Yeah. After. yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Herway. Okay, so like I said, uh, all the new talks are welcome. So if anybody has a talk proposition or something like that, just post it on our GitHub issue page. We will get in contact and uh, make a timetable when you can like do your talk. Yeah, join us also on Slack. So it's like gscgp.com uh, slash, yeah, I'll show it so I can talk. Okay. So basically the same stuff as I said on the beginning, but not everybody was here. So I will repeat myself. So yeah, we have this JSDGB site where you can find the Slack channel. You can join us there, so it looks like this. Uh, also on GitHub, uh, we have this project. Where is our, where is our site located at? And there you have some issues. So if you want to talk, if you want to like share with us some knowledge, uh, prepare for a, I don't know, conference talk or whatever, I think meetups are a great uh, great way to prepare yourself for that stuff. So yeah, just propose it, don't be shy, we don't bite, so hope to see a lot of faces presenting very this year. Thanks a lot, that's it for just desire for you.